<laughs> All right. All right. Um, hi, Martin. Hi, Ron. Thank you for joining us. Um, you can't really see it Thank here, you. but you are before a captive audience here at a Jabo Jabo in Dar. Um, and yeah, we've just screened um, Manga Mizi, the ancient one. Um, and you can, yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of appreciation. Um, thank you for that great story. And I, you know, I'll start us off with a few questions, but hopefully a few other people from the audience will also um, come here with, with a few of theirs. Um, so really, um, it's uh, kind of tough to know where to start, um, but <laughs> I guess like in, in development, um, how did this particular story come about? Because it is um, quite different um, from, even I know Martin, you were very involved in like early um, post-independent in, post cinema and there's that style running through this film. But even thematically, it's very different. So where did this specific yeah. story come from? Well, it started with uh, Arunya Mariamu. As you probably know, Ron had actually come to Tanzania in, back in 1983. And that's long, long, long ago before most of you were born. And with him, we did, uh, when I was still working with Tanzania Film Company, we did a film called Arusia Mariamu which uh, was written by Ron originally and was supported by a, a colleague of, of ours, the late uh, Nangayo Mangoge. And it was such a beautiful story. And it basically rocked, I would say, the world because it was the, the first Tanzanian film ever to get any awards. And it all, not only got any awards, it, it captured maybe about 12 awards everywhere in the world. I mean, as best film everywhere it went. And that was a very eye op a good eye opener for us. And it was maybe 10 years later when I visited Ron in, in the States and he said, Martin, why don't we do part two of uh, Harusi? And of course, both of us knew we were never going to do part two of Harusi, but we would do something similar to Harusi because the theme of uh, traditional medicine was very, very important to, to Ron as well as to myself. And therefore, I think the idea was to try to make or write a story that would relate to that kind of theme. So that was the original pickup. And uh, uh, many years later, I think in uh, 1993, uh, is, that, is that right, Ron? Ron yeah. came over. Oh, 1992 or 93, Ron came over to Australia and spent three months and we wrote the script. But in actual fact, part of the script had already originally been written by Ron's wife, Queen Anne, because we felt that story, the story that had, she had already written was very close to what we were imagining we could shoot as a, as a story of the relationship between Africa Africans in the continent and Africans in America. So that is the genesis of the story. Maybe Ron can take off from me uh, after that. Yeah, I, I think you covered it really well. Um, uh, I think also, um, you know, in the context of, of TFC, hoping that, you know, a co-production would, uh, would uh, let, would, enhance the company and keep it going and uh so yeah and it's also interesting um the story that my wife wrote who's african-american uh was her one script that was about a, a white character uh <laughs> because the professors all said you can't sell any black scripts in hollywood you got to write something white so uh when, but when martin read the script based on the uh, goddess Hecate, he said, man, there's so many elements here that would work in Tanzania. And that's how we, we, we adapted it uh, where Mangamizi became the, the ancient one. And uh, that's, how, that's sort of how it started. But it's interesting how this, uh, this sort of uh, structural racism in America <laughs> ended up being the most African and, and the first African language story to, 
to compete in the Academy Awards in the foreign language category. Hey, no, that's, that, that is really, really fascinating. And so in terms of the research, I mean, I know, as you say, um, your, your, your wife had the story and you guys did the, uh, some of the rewrites. Um, and I know that, I guess, um, your previous movie, you speak that there was a, a big focus on traditional medicine. So in terms of like the research process and developing some of the elements that went within there, like the rituals and even the songs and um, basically the costumes, how much of that was, how, how, how was that process? Okay, yeah. Uh, to start with, with the costumes, we technically thought uh, would use the tie and the dye to start with. There's a central theme of the in the in the asylum because we felt that defined a kind of a mid-range identity between the past and the and the present in terms of uh, uh, defining who we who we are talking about. So the the, the environment itself helped uh, uh, make us decide on what kind of costumes would wear, we would wear as at least they would be used for the for the asylum. For the rest of the crew, we basically went for what would suit best. And so there was not much uh, research, so to say, between what uh, the doctor would wear, the, old, uh, the, the traditional doctor would wear, and how uh, Mangamese would be dressed. Maybe the Mangamese choice was a little bit difficult. And it took a while to actually finally decide, because I think Ron had come up with ideas from from the States. And when I saw the, half, the photograph of Ham, of uh, what's that, uh, Barbara Oz, I think, mom, or something like that, we said, oh, she's almost like the manga Mizu, we thought. If we dressed her up with the, you know, with the, with the Swahili uh, by Bui, she would be perfect. So it's again a combination of, of, uh, recognizing things that actually would work instead of simply saying, I'm going to design something new about this. And we thought uh, the whole idea of combining the, 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 the elements, so to say, the elements that were forcing us, the elements of, uh, of distance, the elements of history, the elements of demand, you know, to, to, to stories that demand to be told. Those helped us to, to make decisions on how to uh, what we are going to how we are going to tell the story, and when it came to Bagamoyo, the choice of Bagamoyo was very simple because we were telling a story with a huge uh, slave element. I mean, the historical element of, of slavery, and therefore Bagamoyo became a very important place. And the location, when we went to visit the location, it was just the best place we could even imagine. But you should hear the story of how we actually ended up in there because we asked for permission from the government and it took how many weeks? Almost two weeks of hanging around the office. Yeah. And this, uh, this gentleman would not give us a permission just to use that building. And we even ended up uh, offering $600 to, uh, to pay $600 then to actually use the location. And he said, no. So we decided, I think it was a decision was made by my wife, my then wife, who decided to walk to the state house, called the state house and said, we need the, we need the, the, the hall in, in, uh, in Bagamoyo. And somebody just made the call and said, yeah, you can use it. So we ended up not paying one cent to the office of the antiquity. <laughs> I mean, that wow. is how stupid, you know, <laughs> some Thank bureaucrats you. can be. Thank you, Casta. <laughs> Our gratitude to your wife, Martin, surely. Um, <laughs> that's, um, yeah, no, that's, that is really, uh, really, really fascinating. And so I guess it's a, it was a long shooting process and a long development process, no? Oh, long. I mean, like yep. I told you first, it's a three, uh, about three months in, uh, in, this, in, in, uh, in Australia where we worked on the story and uh, was not sleeping at all. And one of the scenes that I remember that uh, I walked from, the, from sleep was we were writing and we couldn't find a dramatic entry point for the third act, so to say. And we were just struggling writing, what do we, what do, we do here? And in the past, now I'm getting too old to try these tricks. 
But uh, I used to do a trick where I, if, I, if I found that I couldn't write, I would wheel myself to sleep. So I would go back into bed and sleep. So I did that on that night. And right in the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, I found the, you know, the, the, the cracks here. Woke up Ron and I told him, you know the place where she, uh, the, where uh, uh, Samehe uh, self-hypnotizes herself. We thought that is the highest point of control. So to say, if you, if you can actually self-hypnotize yourself and make yourself go to another space, that is the highest point of drama. So that became the third act. And from that moment on, the story went on smoothly. So you can imagine these are the kind of things you believe in. <laughs> you, know, you can't even write or prepare them for, you know, for, for this eventuality. Thank you. That, that's why we uh, honored the ancestors in, in, in the beginning as the, as the, as the influence. Uh, but yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was just such a great experience. And uh, yeah, I just thank uh, Martin for, it took us, uh, over a six year period, uh, you know, we, we, we had, uh, there was a lot of uh, challenges uh, in shooting. We shot most of the film uh, in 94. And then uh, we were out of, out of uh, funds, you know, the, the currency had changed. I mean, the, the, the dollar to shillings had changed and, and we had to rent equipment from Nairobi because, uh, Things had changed at TFC. There wasn't as much equipment as we thought we'd have access to. And, and then the embassy bombings happened slowly after. Uh, and it was very difficult to raise money on, on my end uh, to go to Tanzania because there was all this in the West, like, oh, terror, Tanzania has turned into, you know, uh, a real problem. Uh, so we didn't get back until 97 to shoot shoot uh, what we hadn't finished but uh, so it was a it was a long process <laughs> and, uh, but we persevered and uh, it, it 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 came close to ruining both our lives but we didn't <laughs> we persevered <laughs> okay Thank you. And so, yeah, my final question before I, I ask the audience for some. Um, so throughout this whole process, how did you get an actress like Barbara, Barbara O on board and hang on for for those six years? Because I mean, I know her <laughs> from uh, Daughters of the Dust, but I know she's also done a lot of work and she's really like uh, very, very well known. Um, and so that sort of caliber of, caliber of actress convincing, persuading to, come through this process? How did that, how was that, how did that work? Ron, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, my mentors when I was at UCLA uh, and my, my thesis film was our co-production Arisia Meriamo. And I, all of my mentors are really what's termed as the LA Rebellion filmmakers, uh, Haile Garima, Charles Burnett, uh, Billy Woodbury, uh, and you know, Haile Garima in his uh, in his uh, film *Bush Mama*, uh, Barbara o had acted, and uh, so anyhow, uh, we had tried to get another Hollywood actress, uh, Alfre Woodard, to do the part, and she demanded so much money up front that there was no way she she wanted three hundred thousand up front and wanted to own part of the picture, I believe, and uh, that's when I approached. Barbara O, uh, and um, and Barbara O said yes, and and most of my cast and crew from America, I mean Barbara, including Barbara O, everyone loved the story, and almost everyone put in the time without without pay. It was basically just per diem during the shoot. They paid their way. They loved the script, and you know there was a lot of love that went into this. <laughs> Actually, we're still we're still in debt on the movie. We're we're almost I think about eighty thousand dollars. We're 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 almost there. Twenty years later, and and that's that's the uh, challenge is, you know, Hollywood did not really 
when we when we when we went from African festivals to black festivals to the world festival in in uh, Montreal, and we got a good review in Variety and and um, then we went on a whole nother level, and that's when Tanzania entered it as its category uh, in the in the foreign language. And it was the first sub-Saharan African language film to ever compete in the Academy Awards. The only other African film before that was the Battle of Algiers. So it was like, really, we were breaking the doors open. And three years after that, the German language film about the colonial experience in Kenya won, and then Sotsi from South Africa, and then Hotel Rwanda. So three, three films from Africa won the year the following years after Magamisi competed, although we, we won a lot of awards, got a lot of critical acclaim, but, but distribution was only in the UK uh, for a three week period, I think in 17 cities. So, so I'm really happy it's getting out and being seen. We finally got it up streaming and, um, you know, but it's, it's been, the structural racism has been part of the challenge of, of getting and, if I listen to my co-director Mahando, we might <laughs> if and we would shot the whole thing in English or at least done an English version, maybe we would have got distribution back then. But that's been a real difficult um, and and in a way painful, I think, for both of us that such a wonderful film has really not really gotten seen. Hello. Hello. So, so thank you so much for making um, this, uh, this work of art. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about um, displaced Africans coming home and continental Africans accepting us. Um, but my question is more so, uh, what do you see for the future of African art in general, um, and, but particularly African film? We need to be how do I put it, a little bit uh, experimental in the way that we approach African films. I think uh, up till now, the, 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 the range of the diversity, so to say, of films between Nollywood and the more, uh, so to say, creative and professionally made films is, is huge. But I think the, the problem actually is not simply in terms of the quality as well as the, fi the, 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 the funding of those films. I think what is probably missing is the, the courage of filmmakers in Africa to talk about Africa from a, a less realistic perspective. I think we are so locked in to, be, to tell our real stories, so to say, you know, almost following, you know, this popular, popular culture and uh, realism. And I think that is holding us back. We have an opportunity to actually use the resources, the, the background, the histories that we have to tell bigger stories, bigger stories in terms of world stories. We can create our own worlds. And I think that is what is that will that is what will move African movies to the next level, where people will be able to to not just stay within the African realm, but actually move away to a place where only Africans can take you there. But you actually under, recognize it because it is part and parcel of this general world. And I think that is where I, I, would, I would like to see the next uh, uh, movement. Of, of young African maker, you know, filmmakers taking us. Uh, they shouldn't stay with Nollywood, nor should they stay with these expect, expectations of grandeur. I think they should just go for, I am able to creatively create a new world that is Africa-based, but it speaks of the world. And that go. <laughs> you know, we still have a structural challenge and uh, I think, uh, you know, Netflix can come and, and promote, but where is the money staying, you know? Uh, that's what I loved about the, you know, a lot of the um, systems that were, you know, African countries had their, 
and, and this is from my perspective and my opinion, uh, had film companies and and uh, and in the West, you know, these uh, organizations and these film institutes, there's a lot of government support. There's tax credits. There's all kinds of things that goes into it. And um, I really hope that Africa can have, you know, local control and, and that the economics come back into Africa where it's not just Hollywood or Netflix or Amazon just really um, take, taking the talent of Africa and all the exports go out and the money really doesn't stay. And they say, oh, it's real cheap to shoot in South Africa. It's real cheap to the, you know, but the stories are there for it to be successful. It's, it's got, I believe, to have uh, government promotion uh, of, of uh, locally in, in, in African countries. Otherwise, um, these, uh, cap the capitalistic system is just gonna be um, taking the, the finance. Uh, that's what it's gonna take. My mentors in the, in the LA Rebellion movement, those were, we made the films that Hollywood wouldn't make and that we may still be in a transition of that, but, um, <laughs> I, I think we just got to somehow, if we're not controlling um, the gatekeepers and we're not controlling the economics, then it's going to be very difficult to break through the, the Hollywood structure or the Bollywood structure or all of those sorts of things. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyhow. It does. And, and um, to, hear, to hear you speak about your mentors in the LA Rebellion movement is powerful. Um, and one of the questions, the last question that I have is um, considering everything that they made, um, that you all made, and, and how much it was, um, uh, you know, negated, uh, just torn down, and similar to all of the rest of the, the movements at that time that were um, talking about equality what are some movements or projects or um, organizations that you see, that you all see that are coming from the continent right now that are exciting you, um, aside from Ajabu Ajabu? Um. Uh, I think the, the whole idea of uh, African festivals that focus on African cinema, this is something that's coming out you know, really serious. And uh, you know the the number of festivals that, that are are being born without fear, without fear of the fact that uh, you know they would be they would die maybe in, in the next five years. I think that is something that we, we all have to you know to, to expect. Is if 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 something has to die, it has to die. But I think the, just that that uh, that energy to 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 create platforms where African films can actually be seen, that can actually be uh, competed against. The one thing that I really hate is the whole idea of now that's coming out of all these award systems, you know, that everybody who, who, who can promote themselves creates a, a festival where they, the only thing they do is not even care about uh, the films, they don't even care about the quality, it's just the awarding system. So people can become stars. And I think that's gonna kill the whole, the, the whole industry because nobody's gonna care about uh, who won where because there are so many wins, so many uh, categories of excellence where we don't even don't know how to measure anymore. And I think that probably is something that we need to look at to see how best we can actually create a system by which we can measure excellence from an African perspective. We should create an environment where excellence is identified due to specific qualities that only African filmmakers can actually uh, agree. That for me is, uh, is, is what I would say should be coming out. And that I, maybe I didn't answer your, uh, your question because I didn't say which other thing that is coming up, but I think uh, 
the new festivals maybe and the new platforms that are coming out are probably going to be the, the next uh, thing that is going to push uh, the African cinema to its uh, higher uh, level. It's much cheaper now than it's ever been to, to produce. Um, and uh, you know that that's very hopeful. And I and I and I'm, you know, a, a young elder looking at social media. I mean, it's a whole under almost an underground economy now, where people uh, it's sort of based on that, how many followers and this that and the other. But I'm exploring it because I, you know I I don't want to be a dinosaur. If if social media is the way we can get Manga Mizi scene and some of the other scenes. Uh, out there, uh, the pandemic for me, I spent basically a year getting all the all of the films I've worked on, you know, streamable, and and it, I don't know how the quality turned out tonight uh, on it, but uh, if I hadn't have done that work, you wouldn't have been able to see it tonight, and um, so I, I'm very hopeful as far as uh, whether they're for free, whether they're for cost. Um, but, but just, uh, uh, now we can, we can approach the audience almost on our own, uh, without the studio system, uh, without the structural system, but it's, it's a matter of really getting some excitement, uh, around it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, and I, uh, and, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, as far as we're going forward. First of all, just immensely grateful um, for this film, for your persistence and perseverance in getting it out into the world. Um, and even in watching it right now, something that keeps coming to mind that I've been thinking about often is like this concept of belatedness. Um, the idea that this film, for example, was produced in 2001 and we're seeing it now, um, or um, that so many of these themes are still ongoing and we're still unpacking them. Um, so to that effect, I have two like fairly related questions. Um, and a few of us were talking about this earlier, but just how much this film is packed with such multiple sites of trauma. We're dealing with transatlantic trauma. We're dealing with like transgenerational trauma with the grandmothers and bringing that in with dealing with sexual trauma. There's just so much. Um, so I'm just curious as to um, how you made some of those choices in the writing, what stayed, I'm sure there was like a fair amount of like editing that went into that. I think it's the, the, the history that was actually driving this. You know, the history between Africans, Africans on the continent and Africans outside the continent, the diaspora. The story is about the relationship between these two peoples. And this, this is a very spiritual story. This is a, sp a story that would not simply just give in. It's a 400, 500, 600 years story. And that's, that's where we got the energy because every time we wanted to, to tell a story from the African perspective, the, the, the African-American perspective came in and then it says, oh, no, 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 this is not just an African, uh, African perspective. This is an Indian perspective. This is also you know, uh, 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 an Irish perspective. So slowly we were able to actually uh, understand what it meant for an African to be moved to another world and create a different you know, uh, energy there that is still coming back. And for me, uh, Asira's return is the, is, is the cycle, you know? it's, it's a cycle that we are going, all going to be playing for the next so many years in the world. And therefore the stories that, we, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the sociological stories, the psychological stories that we, are, we were binding in, it's because of the result of a very strong historical basis, the history of dispersal, the, dis the history of uh, struggle, this, the history of pain, the history of anger. That by itself was making us tell the story of a world that will always be facing those you know, emotional, and historical, and sociological problems. So that's how I think the story you know, of Manga Mizi resonates with other people. It's because it has a very strong historical base, and historical as well as sociological base. Yeah, well said. The choice of the name for the film, it's called Manga Mizi, Destruction, but really the movie is about hope, reconciliation. So like, uh, how did you go about choosing the name and the story? 
uh, because I, I think before I've watched it, I had different opinions of what it would be. Uh, the original story was based on the destroyer goddess, sort of the Kali, uh, although Hecate, uh, you know, this, this dual energy of, uh, of uh, you know, destruction and rebirth and, uh, and uh, the, the elements of, uh, you know, nature. Uh, in West Africa, it's maybe the Oya energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, these were the themes, I think, running through. But uh, I think, uh, Martin, you were the one that came up with the Swahili uh, title. Yeah. yeah. No, I, actually, like you say, the, the original base, the story was actually about the goddess Kali. And the goddess Kali is, you know, very strong Kali, you know, Kali goddess. And, uh, but it's also the, the, the historically, many of the uh, of the strong angry god gods or goddesses and you know, not god, you know, not gods goddesses in the world have actually been women they've never been you know quite a lot of i don't i, I can't remember any who was actually a man they were all women and so we started with that that there's a strength within women that can help build something new. That anger was not, I mean, the anger or that Kali element was not the basis of you know, femininity. The basis was actually birth. So the story, like Farid, like uh, the Ron said, it's actually the story of rebirth rather than the, of, 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 of destruction. But the destruction is necessary in order for you, to, for something to be reborn. And so, Mangamizi was actually not even a word. They actually almost coined it. There was a, a destruction, but how, how do, what, what do you call my destruction in Kiswahili? And we, we, we found so many words, but none of them was Mangamizi, Kuangamia, or whatever it is. We coined that. Now it is, you know, it's basically a, 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 a word that everybody uses as if it's been there for the last uh, 10,000 words, I mean, 10,000 years. It's, I think what, was, what we were trying to say is destruction is not simply a process by which you end things. Destruction can also lead to renewal, rebirth, the beginning of the other things. And Mangamizi actually says it. She says, you know, there's the, through the fire, you will be reborn. And even, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the pango, what do you call it? In the cave, <laughs> you know, she, uh, the, 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 the mother, what was it? The, uh, yeah. the mother says, or the, the Ganga says, you will be reborn and reborn. Uzaliwe tena na tena. Okay. So I mean, the translation is very difficult, but Uzaliwe tena na tena means there's no going to be an end to your yeah. rebirth. So yeah. the world is going to be re reborn forever. And so I think the whole idea of rebirth, growth, change was inbuilt in that story. And it helped us to, to tell this big story that would probably not have been happening if we did not have a trust and belief in the ancestors who were basically rolling us around. They, yeah. they were playing with us a lot of yeah. times. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't believe that they actually were. <laughs> um, I noticed in the film um, that there was a almost like matter of fact way um, that you had of um, portraying like time travel and like the difference between um, different moments that might've happened in the past or the present and the future. Um, I think that's like really important um, in terms of the way that like we as people of like, or myself as a person of African descent, but also people on the continent have a way of centering themselves temporally in the world that is different, distinctly different um, from different ways that other cultures do. Um, I'm really interested in like the choices that you made to make it that matter of fact, kind of like time language that you did um, in the film and like what the special effects choices that you made, like the reason behind that as well. Um, you know, ed editing and location were our special effects. Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, I think uh, the original story, we had thought of big effects and it was just like, okay, we're not going to be able to do this, but the, the, the Kali ruins, you know, I mean, the special effects was the place. I mean, we added smoke and little fires <laughs> and, but it, and, and I think um, what's beautiful about film is it really, I think works like our minds work, you know, our minds can be within a couple of minutes, maybe in a hundred different locations, you know, and I think that was, uh, it, and, and to, you know, to relieve myself of like, um, and trusting that, okay, if this is how our mind works and, and this is, and we're dealing with time and history and, and all of these things, then, you know, who's to say uh, we, we need a, a special effect transition. It's just like, and, and I think that's sort of the magic of the film when we have a hypnosis session and, and then we're, we're in the place and we're in the, the, the where, where mama, the, I think in the script, we call it the place of destruction or desolation. Or, and, and in that context, uh, you know, uh, the, the mother could talk about the history and, and what's come and this destruction and, you know, what's going to grow out of it and, and her own daughter, the conflict there. And, you know, the, how, how do we do this mother daughter thing? And, and, you know, it's really, that's when Samehe really breaks away from her mother and says, yeah, I'm going to take your wisdom. You might be stuck, yeah. but I'm going to take your wisdom and move on. And she makes her stance. And so these are all universal, uh, universal themes in a way. And, and even in life, um, uh, her mother took her stand with the tradition and lost her life for it. Uh, so, you know, we got to deal with <laughs> all these amazing things and, and we were blessed with these amazing, uh, actors and, and locations and also, you know, just not giving up and, and, and just, uh, uh, in a way going where the wind was, was blowing us. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should talk about the actors a little bit. I mean, Amandina yeah. was very central in in what this how this film came out. I mean, the choice mm -hmm. of Amandina was absolutely spot on, and you should know that she actually wrote and uh, what uh, how they she even uh, wrote and um, what's the word about so making a song? <laughs> yeah, performs she's, a she's song. She's called her own song, literally, you know. Yeah, she wrote it and then she said, Martin, can I sing this to you? I think this is what it's going to be like. I don't want to sing whatever you want to me to sing. And she came up with a song which absolutely was spot on. And uh, there were places where you know, we, we wanted to, 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 to bring ourselves in and the characters would not allow us. Technically, the characters you know, <laughs> move, you know, change the story because they wanted to go in that direction many yeah. many times i mean the, yeah. the, 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 the twins was just one of those one of those moments uh, man for, for for me at least there's always been uh, this desire to understand history in its uh, how do I put it? And it's uh, of, of, uh, outside its, 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 its context, so to say. That's why when I, when, when I talked about uh, the new story that I expect for, to come from Africa, I said it's important for us to create worlds. And Mangamizi is a total world. It is not simply just a... a, 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 a a, a, a realistic world. It's a created world whereby we were able to relate to what was actually happening, what could be happening, 
and what could probably be happening many, many years later. And therefore we had a lot of uh, planes of history to, play, to, to work through and to recognize, first not to, not to recognize, but to find the structure through which you can actually move back and forth in time. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most important uh, uh, elements that we had to think through most of the time. Even though it was, uh, the time scales were kind of illogical, we created a logic in that uh, time frame, And I think that is, the, that is what we should be uh, thinking about in terms of being creative with the material that one has to create a story. There's no limitation as to what you could tell a, a story. The limitations is the logic that you bring into the world that you are creating. Mm. And for, for me, that's what Manga Mies was, was all about. We wanted to, to tell a story of 400, 500 years, mm. and probably that 500 year is not even enough to tell this, you know, the story of the relationship between uh, Africans in the continent and Africans in the, you know, in, the, in the diaspora. Therefore, it is a long story that will continue for many, many years. And we had to find a structure that tells us of a story that will continue for the many, many years. And that's, that's, that, that for me is probably the strength of that film, where we are able to somehow come up with a structure that would help us to tell a story without fear of, in terms of reality or realistic uh, or history, but also be able to tell a wider story that would engulf not only today or tomorrow, but even the future. Walio sama wahenga ukiwa Lawa mandizo zangu Ngera mm.